So today I'm going to tell you how we use bioelectronics to study the gut-brain microbiome axis. So I should say that the research group that I lead is called the Bioelectronic Systems Technology Group. And what we do is we integrate in vitro models of various organs and tissues with cutting edge electronics to be able to monitor them. And I'll explain why we do that as I go through. So first of all, why do we need toxicology testing? So a lot of what we do with my group is we develop models that will allow us to understand how new products such as therapeutics um, uh, can be used in human uh, situations to develop uh, new drugs or to understand how different pathogens or toxins may affect humans. Um, and I'd like to um, point to Paracelsus, who was called the grandfather of toxicology. So he said that all things are poison and nothing is without poison. Only the dose permits something not to be poisonous. So in a sense, what we're trying to do is to understand that really nice window where we have a good therapeutic effect, but we're not being toxic. And to develop that, you have to do a lot of studies. And those studies take a long time and involve a lot of steps. So the typical drug discovery process lasts about 12 years and often is very, very expensive. Um, one of the numbers that's uh, given is often around $2.5 billion for one FDA approved drugs. That would be in the United States, of course. So it takes a long time. It involves a lot of steps. And the very first step is where you would do what's called an in vitro assay. So that's working not in an animal, but actually using, for example, human cells in some sort of a Petri dish in the lab. Um, and you can do that with um, different types of cells that we have available to us. You can also do some work um, with animals. After that, you would move to an animal toxin, uh, toxicity testing stage, which may take another couple of years. And then after that, you would go to a sort of a small scale uh, human trial and then maybe a larger scale human trial. And even after the drug is developed, you would still have post-marketing surveillance. So this explains why the whole system is so expensive and so complicated. But what it really means is that we have to get that very first step right. And because we're moving from human to maybe animal and then back to human, we have to be able to correlate the results that we get in the early stages with those that we get later on. And we really have to understand how that works. So in a sense, we want our in vitro stage um, with the human cells to be very predictive of human biology and to really be able to tell us what's happening and um, to be you know, accurate. Uh, a lot of drugs that go through this very expensive pipeline don't actually do what they should do. And particularly for studying things like dementia in humans, a lot of the animal work tends not to be as predictive as we'd like it to be. So a lot of researchers are working very hard on the in vitro space. So getting um, more complicated, more human relevant, things that more closely mimic human physiology to be able to test drugs and toxins and pathogens and things like that. So um, there's been some really nice advances in recent years. One of the most exciting things from my point of view has been this idea that you could take cells from an adult human, so it's non-invasive, you can take skin cells, for example, you can reprogram them and then you can turn them into pretty much any cell type of the body that you care to mention. And in this case, it's shown neurons. And then, you know, Lots of people have proposed this as a way to recover some sort of a lost function in a human, but actually you can use those sorts of technologies in the in vitro space to be able to do high throughput screening on, on you know, live human cells um, taken from, say, patient vol volunteers. This would even allow you to do um, patient-specific drug testing in the future. So this in vitro space is very, very important. Now, if you combine that with our ability to miniaturize and sort of develop technologies that allow us to monitor things in a lab situation, then this becomes very, very exciting. So I'd like to introduce you the idea of organ on chip technology. So you may have heard of lab on chip. So that was an idea developed probably about 30 to 40 years ago. And the idea was that you could take the various different processes that happen in a lab on benches um, in any you know, chemistry lab or biology lab you can think of, and you could miniaturize those and put them on a chip. Um, and that obviously is, is great for reducing the number of reagents, but also 
Uh, it can speed things up, as you would imagine, and it can be less expensive. Now, if you have go from lab on a chip to organ on a chip, what you want to do then is to integrate organs with some of these fluidic technologies, and you could even have multiple organs. So you could have, for example, something we're interested in, the gut and the brain on a chip. Now, there was a, 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 an exciting project a number of years ago um, to develop a human on a chip or a body on a chip where you could connect all kinds of different organs. And you could even, for the first time, maybe have a replacement for some of the animal studies because you could mimic how a drug would absorb into the body, for example, by ingestion or eating. Um, you could mimic how it could get across the gastrointestinal tract and then how it would move along in the bloodstream and, for example, enter into other target organs like the brain. So this was the first time this was able to be imagined in a lab in vitro setting. So I'd like to just allude to some of the current and future challenges for organ-on-chip technology. So this idea of, you know, multi-organ on chip was developed by some researchers in Boston um, in around 2010. And their goal was by 2020, I believe, to have this 10 organ um, body on chip model. But they have encountered some difficulties. I won't go into the, all of them now, but one of the greatest difficulties was how to monitor the system. How did you know what was actually going on? If you think about it, they put tremendous effort um, into developing these systems that often had to grow for three, four weeks, all kinds of problems with getting the right media, knowing how to feed the cells, how was the liver compartment going to be different from the heart and different from the brain, etc. And so what they really needed to do was to integrate inline sensing technologies. And that's where we come in, if you like. We are integrating uh, monitoring that would allow you to continuously measure things like the health of the cells over time. Um, and I'm going to show you some data towards that. So that's what we've been developing. So um, now I'm going to switch to how we have used bioelectronics to monitor cultures in vitro. And as I'll show you, we did that initially on some quite simple so-called 2D models and then um, realized that really we needed to move towards 3D models. So let me show you first some data that we gathered uh, a number of years ago now, so it's about seven years, where we tried to understand how cells growing on an electrode could be measured. So this is a, a, a relatively simple concept. Um, if you think about a cell as mostly being insulating, if you have ions traveling from a solution into um, or near an electrode, um, if you have cells that um, you know, are side by side, but not that close together, you can imagine that quite a number of the ions will go through into the electrode. Um, if you have cells, though, on the other hand, like these ones, which represent um, so-called barrier-forming cells, so these would be found, for example, in the gastrointestinal tract or in the blood-brain barrier, the role of these cells is to protect the host from anything that might be nasty or toxic or dangerous. So they're really, really good at forming a barrier, not just to things like microorganisms, which would be on the micron scale, but even to ions. And so you get much more resistance. So what we did was we used um, actually a different type of an electrode. It's made of a conducting polymer, which is transparent. So that was very nice. So we were able to image the cells. You can see gold contacts on these devices here and then cells growing and we can actually image the cells in the center um, of the device. And then what we did was we measured different types of cells that were either more on this side of things, so less resistant, and more, or more on this side, so more resistant. And what we see is that when we have highly resistant cells, we're measuring here a property called um, transconductance. I won't go into too much detail on what that is, but it's essentially how good, um, how many ions are going into this device and um, turning it on. And we measure that over a frequency range. So we see the highly resistant cells on this side, and then cells um, like HeLa cells, which you may have come across if you read the, the book, uh, The Immortal Life of Henrietta Lacks. Um, they are adherent cells, so they attach to an electrode, but they don't block much more than that. And then we, of course, compare that with a control where we don't have any cells at all. 
And we're able to extract then the sort of the resistance properties of these cells. So this is a really nice readout also because it's a continuous readout. So if we do um, any kinds of measurements optically, then we may have to stop the experiment. Whereas if we do the electrical um, measurement, we can do continuous monitoring. Um, so moving on, um, I want to show you an example now. So this is a time-lapse video. So that means we're taking, um, we're taking shots of these cells growing in one of our devices every few uh, minutes. And we, in this case, can actually do live optical imaging. It's quite a um, complicated experiment to set up because we have to introduce uh, a genetic modification to the cells to make them fluoresce or to express this um, fluorescent dye. Um, and we can see if we zap the cells electrically, so we kill them, and then we watch them recover over time, we can image that. So that's nice, you can measure it, but it's not really that quantitative. Whereas if we um, use the electrode to measure, what we see is we zap the cells and we see a, a complete decrease of the, the so-called barrier. And then if we wait, we can heal over time and we see uh, an increase in the resistance. So the nice thing about these devices is we could combine optical imaging and electronic imaging, but the electronic, Im um, sorry, electronic monitoring, the electronic monitoring is always a lot more sensitive. So that is nice, but as you know, the world is not 2D, it's 3D. So um, we had to think a little bit, go back to the drawing board and think about how we could integrate electronic devices with three-dimensional cell cultures in the lab. So 3D good, 2D bad. Now this required some uh, out-of-the-box thinking. And first of all, I want to just tell you a little bit how we have to think, what, what's the importance of a 3D culture or a culture where we think about what the physiological environment is. And to demonstrate that, I want to illustrate with an example um, of some testing we did a number of years ago now, where we were trying to understand what was the effect of electronic cigarette vapor on uh, a culture of cells. Now we grew the cells, so these are cells of the trachea, and we grew them on this so-called um, hanging insert. So it's a porous nylon insert where um, there are holes in the insert so the cells can feel cues, so they get stimuli from um, a cell culture media which is made up of all kinds of hormones and growth factors and sugars and, uh, and things like that. But what's really important for cells of the trachea is that they don't have any liquid on top. So unless you're severely ill, you, your, your lung or your trachea shouldn't have any liquid on the top. It's what we call an air-liquid interface. And that's moving towards a more physiologically relevant model. In other words, if we don't have air on the top and liquid below, then it's not really a good model of the trachea. And then if we measure the effect of um, electronic cigarette vapor, we may not be getting um, the sorts of uh, experimental data that we would see that would really tell us what's going on. So this is quite a cool setup. We had this box that allowed us to introduce the electronic cigarette vapor as an aerosol. So we, we had our cigarette attached and uh, it puffed into the, into the device. And what we saw was that in response to different numbers of puffs of cigarette, we saw a, a, a response. So in other words, we would have the cells without any electronic cigarettes, they're nicely resisting these ions from going through. But then as we added these puffs, we saw things decreasing rapidly over time. So again, an example of where having continuous monitoring really made sense. What you're looking at here is the, is the baseline. So we see a nice resistance um, when we have the cells integrated with our device. And this was only made possible because we had engineered the device to be conformal. So we were able to sit it on top of the cells and be able to measure. Um, and so we have one electrode here, one electrode here. So this is different from the planar setup um, where you had the two electrodes side by side and the cells growing on them in the previous example. But it's still not, so it's integrating electronics with a three-dimensional model of the trachea and we're mimicking physiological conditions but it's still not really a three-dimensional electrode, and that's where we wanted to go next.
So the next example I'll show you, it's all going to be in the context of the gut-brain microbiome access. So I'll take a moment just to introduce that to you and to tell you how we use bioelectronics. So you probably have read about this, you probably know about the importance of your microbiome. So this is the trillions of bacteria and fungi and other species that live in your gastrointestinal tract and indeed in other parts of your body and that are very important for um, our health. So you should have a nice diverse cohort which is um, keeping you healthy and um, we know that there is a very distinct communication between your gut and your brain. So when you start to have imbalances in your gut microbiome, you start to have some things that manifest in the gut. Um, that can be inflammation where you have inflamed tissue. It could lead to things like um, leaky gut where you start to have um, the barrier not working very well and maybe even some of those commensal, those nice bacteria invading into your bloodstream. But you can also get some sorts of signaling. Somehow your gut is telling your brain things aren't quite right and it can manifest in all kinds of things thought to be uh, anxiety thought to be linked, depression is thought to be linked and even other things like autism spectrum disorder. So we would really like to understand more about the gut-brain axis. And a number of years ago, I proposed that an in vitro model would be a great way to be able to study this. Um, it's simpler than getting a lot of human volunteers, as you can imagine, and it would allow us to do more of the sorts of screening um, tests that we would like to do. So how do we use bioelectronics to help us understand the gut-brain axis in vitro? Um, the gut-brain axis is a very interesting topic um, that has intrigued a lot of people. You probably have heard about how you have trillions of microbes and bacteria and virus and fungi all living happily in your gut, actually contributing to your health. Um, and it's only when we have an imbalance in uh, this population that we start to see evidence of things um, that can lead to different types of pathologies um, in humans. Um, we know that the gut-brain axis and, and your microbiome can be related to a number of different disorders, including anxiety, depression, and even maybe uh, autism spectrum disorder. And a lot of that may start in the gut via uh, imbalances, like I said, with your microbiome. So a number of years ago, I proposed that having an in vitro model to, to study the gut-brain microbiome axis would be really interesting because we could do a lot more high-throughput monitoring, a lot more screening of different ideas and hypotheses that we have. Of course, it's challenging, but there are a lot of ways that bioelectronics can help us in this um, goal. So one of the first things is we could study um, hormones and neurotransmitters or various different um, metabolites, for example, that the gut cells um, might produce in concert with uh, the microbes of the microbiome, so-called commensal bacteria, which are the nice, happy, healthy ones. Um, we can study those with electronics. I won't show more evidence of that today. Um, we can also use uh, electronics to study the enteric nervous system. So we know that there are a lot of neurons uh, in your gut, in fact, as many as might be found in the brain of a dog. And we know that there is a, a connection to the central nervous system via the vagus nerve. Um, of course, electronics can be used to study this. And in the central nervous system, the go-to method for understanding how um, the brain works is using electrodes or electrode arrays or um, implanted electronics. But the thing I'll focus on more today is our ability to measure the so-called um, gastrointestinal barrier. So that's made up of the epithelial cells which line your gastrointestinal tract and the tightness of that barrier gives you a measure of the healthiness of the barrier. And it's in certain cases where we start to see some of the pathologies, we see a breakdown in the barrier and so-called leaky gut, which then can be exacerbated by some of the bacteria and other organisms moving from gastrointestinal tract into your bloodstream. I've already shown you evidence of how electrodes can measure um, gastrointestinal barrier properties or barrier tissue properties in general. So um, that's something that we focus on quite a lot. And you can not only measure that in the case of the gut, you can also measure it in case of the blood-brain barrier. So that's the 
um, endothelial barrier that's formed um, uh, that protects your brain essentially, sort of like a secondary protection mechanism. So that's how bioelectronics can help. Um, but as I mentioned before, we don't want to use two-dimensional electrodes in this case. We want to de develop complex 3D models of the gastrointestinal tract. And so to do that, we started thinking about how we could make three-dimensional electrodes. And so we use a process called freeze-drying, where we take a liquid conductor, so that's known as P.PSS. Um, it's the same transparent um, material we were using to make uh, devices in the earlier example I showed you. And we um, put it into a device that will freeze it. And then we go straight to subliming out the ice crystals. So we skip the liquid phase. And we are left with a sponge-like material, which is quite soft. You can see it here. Um, you can. It's squishy, you can squish it. It's dark because it's um, a conducting polymer that absorbs in a certain part of the spectrum. And so um, we did some studies where we grew cells inside these um, materials. We have an example here where it has a central pore or lumen, which mimics that of the gastrointestinal tract. We showed it was cytocompatible. We could get cells to grow there. We have certain cells that mimic the sort of tissue underneath. And then we have the gastrointestinal cells on the lining. This is, of course, imag imaging, and we see that the cells um, express the right kinds of markers that we would expect. But what was probably more exciting and novel was the fact that we could do continuous electrical monitoring. And as before, we see that the increase in resistance follows the differentiation of the cells. So as the cells become more and more barrier-like, we see an increase in the impedance. So this is monitoring impedance versus frequency and um, impedance is a measure of how resistant, or you can extract the resistance of the cells from this measurement. Just to give you an idea of what it looks like, so this is obviously a zoom in, this is micro CT uh, analysis, and you can see it's an interconnected sponge, and obviously because it's all connected, when we apply a potential on one side, we can measure something on the other side. And, and even if you need more convincing that it's a so-called biomimetic scaffold, um, when we grow our tissue, so you see the connective or fibroblast tissue here, and then the epithelial cells here, this is a cross section where we've sent it for H&E staining, that's how pathologists um, stain tissues. We were able to see that our scaffold just looks kind of like part of the tissue, it doesn't seem to be very invasive, so that was good for us. We're trying to mimic the properties of the tissue as much as possible and not to have our technology be too invasive, if you like. So we need to make this a little bit more high throughput. So we turn to a format that's very familiar, familiar to cell biologists. So in fact, a lot of biologists work with so-called well plates. So that's like a, a dish um, about the size, I'm trying to think of something, um, about half the size of your uh, keyboard. And it has a number of holes for you to be able to grow cells and you can pour in the types of um, cell culture media that they need. And in this case, we're using the hanging well format where we're uh, integrating this polymer scaffold that I mentioned and we're sitting it in. It can receive cues from underneath and cues from above. And we can also measure samples from below and above. Um, this is what uh, a scanning electron microscope image of the um, scaffold looks like and we can make different thicknesses. And of course, we characterize the electronic properties of these devices. Um, and we look at the pore size and we can mix in various different components like sugars or um, different proteins that might be important for the tissues. Once we've characterized the devices, then of course we have to try and grow cells inside. And following a protocol we developed earlier, we um, grew inside fibroblasts. So these are cells that produce a lot of extracellular matrix um, and they fill up the pores of the scaffold with lots of proteins and sugars. And then they form a nice layer. And there on top of that, we can um, grow uh, either epithelial cells like cells of the gastrointestinal tract or even endothelial cells like those of the brain or other types of blood vessels. And here below, I've, I've just put images. You can see the fibroblasts. We look at different markers that tell us, yes, those are the right cells, and they're there. This is the nucleus stained in blue. So you can pick out individual cells. 
And then, of course, um, for the gastrointestinal model, we have well-characterized cell types. These are so-called cell lines. And we look for different markers. We see that they're producing mucus, which is very important for the model. It's very important in your gut for hosting the microbiome. And then we did another model, which is an endothelial cell model. So these are cells which represent um, blood vessels in your body. So we can use this technology to model different types, um, to, to model as in have, have cell models that can represent different organs and tissues in the body. Again, though, I'd like to emphasize that the electronic monitoring is really, really powerful. So when we add in the fibroblasts, we actually see a decrease in the overall impedance. So the scaffold becomes less resistant. And we think that's because the fibroblasts are known to be able to pull on the cells. So maybe they're bringing the conducting parts of the scaffold closer together. Then when we add in the two types of cells that represent the gastrointestinal epithelium, we see the characteristic impedance increase, so becoming more resistant as we'd expect. Uh, in the case of the HUVEC, so endothelial cell model, we see an increase in resistance, but we would expect it to be lower, and that's what we do see, because this cell type is known to be more leaky. So the blood vessel is supposed to have better exchange um, in and out, um, so that's a, a known thing. Um, of course, we have to include uh, microbes eventually, and I don't really have time to talk about a lot of that, but initial work showed that we could add bacteria. We use heat-killed bacteria, so we want to see what sorts of proteins or molecules they can secrete, or maybe what's on the outside. Do they inflame our model? But really, if you think about how this works in our bodies, that's what we're trying to mimic. And what we know is that there's probably a pretty good physical barrier between um, the microbes in our gut and the cells themselves. If bacteria come in too close contact to uh, epithelial cells, they can induce inflammation, so the cells get all excited. Um, but the mucus probably just physically separates those. You can get molecule interchange, but not um, sort of a physical stimulating um, effect. So um, we're doing lots more things now, um, very exciting stuff to try and mimic the oxygen environment in the gastrointestinal tract, which changes all the way along. Um, we're including more um, different types of bacteria, which is more representative of a human microbiome. We also want to include anaerobic bacteria, which is what you would find in your colon, for example. But for that, we need to get the oxygen control working. We need to think about where we're feeding the cells. So right now we feed them on the top and on the bottom. But of course, really, your cells are fed by your bloodstream through the vasculature. So really, the cues should only be coming from the bottom. This is a little bit like the tracheal model I showed you earlier, although there is fluid on top of the gastrointestinal cells um, on top of the epithelium. We're integrating various different models. So we have a gut model, a bit more complicated now than the one I showed you, which includes immune cells and neurons. And we also have a model of the neurovascular unit, which includes cells of the central nervous system and the blood-brain barrier. And we're measuring different types of metabolites from our different models. So that allow us to understand what's really going on. We have in vitro models of human and rat, which is very useful because we are starting to do some rat work trying to understand the enteric nervous system which is quite difficult to do if you have an in vitro model. So understanding, for example, how the vagus nerve works. And we feel that if we have in vitro models of both, that'll help us. So the gut-brain axis is fascinating. I'd encourage you to read more about it and actually to think about how your, your diet might affect your brain. Um, and we're doing um, lots of different exciting things to try and understand more of it. It's an intensely multidisciplinary project. I've shown you examples where we're studying chemical engineering principles like diffusion. We're trying to introduce physics, uh, electronics. We're doing simulations, so there's computational work, there's molecular biology, there's biochemistry, there's cell biology, all kinds of um, ways for people of different expertise to get involved. And um, I can now thank the people who were involved in the work. You can see um, it's a great team. Uh, they're listed here. And we get funding from a number of different sources to be able to do this uh, exciting work. And that's it from me. I'd encourage you
to get in touch with me if you have questions about the research and to enjoy um, you know, learning more about research and seeing what chemical engineers and uh, biotechnologists can do.